Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. I'm here with Dr. Pedro Mateo Pedro, who's an assistant professor at the University of Toronto, Canada, a native speaker of Kanhabal, and a learner of Kakchikel. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about kids acquiring Indigenous languages. But first, some announcements. We love looking up whether two words that look kind of similar are actually historically related, but the history of a word doesn't have to define how it's used today. And to celebrate how we can grow up to be more than we ever expected, we have new merch that says, Etymology Isn't Destiny. Our artist, Lucy Maddox, has made Etymology Isn't Destiny into a swoopy cursive design with a fun little destiny star on the dot of the eye, available in black, white, and my personal favorite, rainbow gradient. This design is available on lots of different colors and styles of shirts. We've got hoodies, tank tops, t-shirts in classic fit, relaxed fit, curved fit, plus mugs, notebooks, stickers, water bottles, zipper pouches. You know, if it's on Redbubble, we might have put Etymology as Destiny on it. We also have tons of other Lingthusiastic merch available in our merch store at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I have to say, it makes a great gift to give to a linguistics enthusiast in your life or to request as a gift if you are that linguistics enthusiast. We also want to give a special shout out to our aesthetic redesign of the International Phonetic Alphabet. So last year, we reorganized the classic IPA chart to have colors and have little cute circles and not just be boring gray lines and boxes, and to even more elegantly represent the principle that the location of the symbols in rows and columns represents the place and degree of constriction in the mouth. I think it looks really cool. It's also a fun little puzzle to sit there and figure out which of the specific circles around different things stands for what. We've now made this aesthetic IPA chart redesign available on lots more merch options, including several different sizes of posters, from like small ones you can put on a cork board to large ones you can put up in your hallway. They look really, really good, especially if you have some sort of office space that needs to be decorated. Plus, it's on tote bags and notebooks and t-shirts. If you want everyone you meet to know that you're a giant linguistics nerd, you can take them to conferences and use them to start nerdy conversations with people. And if you like the idea of linguistics merch, but none of ours so far is quite hitting your aesthetic, or there's an item that Redbubble sells that you think one of our existing designs would look good on, we've added quite a few merch items in response to people's requests over the years, so we'd love to know where the gaps still are and keep an eye on lingthusiasm.com slash merch. Our most recent bonus episode was a behind-the-scenes interview with Sarah Dapirella, who you may recognize as a name from the end credits, about what it's like doing transcripts from a linguistics perspective, and her life generally as a linguistics grad student. You can go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm to get access to all of the many bonus episodes and to help lingthusiasm keep running. Hello, Pedro. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you so much for this invitation. I really appreciate it. We're really excited to have you. Let's start with the question that we ask all of our guests. How did you get interested in linguistics? That's an interesting question. I think uh, there are two main things. One is that I had the opportunity to attend a boarding school Mm -hmm. where there were many Maya languages. And in addition to that, there was a class on grammar of Maya languages. And I think that's one of the things that motivated me to be curious about that language. And then after becoming an elementary school teacher, I was also interested about knowing more about how these languages work. For example, language works in this case, uh, well, in the case of Guatemala, for example, people think, or I'm assuming that that was in the past, but there's, I think, some people who still think that indigenous languages don't have a grammar. Mm. And from there as well, is it true that in fact there is no grammar of these languages? That's kind of how no I language started with no grammar. That's true. So, every, <laughs> so that's I, I like the, when people say that everybody has a mental grammar. I like that, and which is true for every yeah. language. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of how I would say how I got interested in linguistics. And you were already a speaker of Kanhobal, and so going to this boarding school and being exposed to other people speaking other languages. Yes, yeah, so I was yeah acquired Kanhobal when I was a kid, and then I went to this uh, boarding school. But unfortunately, I didn't learn any of those languages until later when I started living with my wife, who is a native speaker of Kachkel, and then from there I started to learn. But it has been a long process. For uh-huh. me. To learn the different ones. And so you're at boarding school and you're look, encountering, okay, my languages have grammar. Great. And then what happened after that? 
Well, uh, what I mean, when I graduated from this boarding school, I became an elementary school teacher. So I mm-hmm. taught, I think, a couple of years. But one thing that I noticed is that there was that need to understand a little bit more of the language as well. Let's do something. But one of my friends, best friend, who is uh, Alam Mateo Toledo, he said, well, let's find some place to go. So we went to a school in uh, Guatemala City to study social linguistics. Ah. So at that time, so I'm talking about the Years, years ago, but that was kind of a way to find opportunities to learn a little bit more about the languages. So you studied sociolinguistics in Guatemala City and thought, oh, this is cool, I want to do more of it? So I finished sociolinguistics and then I received a fellowship or a scholarship in a different university. It's Universidad Rafael Landivar. And mm-hmm. there was this project called Edu Maya, where there were uh, scholarships to Mayan speakers or indigenous speakers in Guatemala. So this was an opportunity for me to get an undergrad in uh, linguistics. Okay. So after that, I think I took two or one year off. Mm-hmm. But while I was like kind of with those years from school, I was working at Okma, under the direction of Nora England. And what is this organization? This organization works on Mayan languages of uh-huh. Guatemala. So it's like a group of Mayan speakers mm-hmm. who studied their own language. That sounds great. Well, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it was really great. But in a case, for example, I was an elementary school teacher and then uh-huh. I started to work there at Okuma. It was a huge difference of teaching kids and then like doing the analysis in the languages kind of was for me it's a kind of a big transition, mm-hmm. but it was amazing because I had the opportunity to learn too many things about how Maya languages work and it was unique. Yeah. yeah. And the kids that you were teaching when you were teaching in school were Mayan kids as well? or Yeah, most of them were uh, Mayan kids. So they spoke Han So even though there is this idea about bilingual education in this indigenous community, so I, I had this opportunity to teach these children in Han Ah. One of the norms is that, okay, you teach these kids... And they have to learn Spanish and things like that. So what I did is, okay, let's take as the base the knowledge that they bring from home. They speak the language, they understand yeah. the language. Yeah. So we need to teach them how to write and read. Right. So that's what I did. But I was in trouble because oh. the parents didn't like the idea of teaching their children in Anhobal. They wanted them to learn Spanish. Exactly. So mm. they said, well, why do we need Anhobal? Uh-huh. Why do we need to write and read in Khan if we speak the language. Yeah. And one of the arguments I made is like, okay, yeah, but if we need something already that will help us to learn to write and read. Mm-hmm. It took me a while. So one way to convince the parents and to change their mind was that in the first meeting when they came in to get their children's grade, mm-hmm. I started the meeting in Spanish. Uh-huh. And my message to them in Spanish, it didn't last for a minute. And they stopped me. And they started to kind of complain. And say, why Why would you talk to us in Spanish when in fact you know that we speak Hanhobal? Yeah. So like different people, like they were kind of, they would say angry or uncomfortable because of that. So after that, asking this question, have you thought about your children mm. who, have, I mean, who spend about five or six hours every day here at school. And if I speak to them in Spanish, they're not going to understand exactly. that either. So that was my point. Yeah. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah. Have you thought about that? No. <laughs> Do they complain? No. Okay, because they are kids. They don't know any better. Yeah. So for me, like, it's important for these children to understand what's going on at school. And one way to yeah. do this, using the language that they know. Right. Right. And I was able, like, in this case, like, talk with the parents. Okay, we understand what you are after. Mm-hmm. So I had mm-hmm. the opportunity then to teach the children, at least, I mean, that time. So divide the year in two parts. Mm-hmm. In the first part, I would teach the kids in, like, writing and reading. And mm-hmm. then in the next part of the year, we switch to Spanish. But at least that was an opportunity. They have for sort the of children. a balance of the yeah. two and mm-hmm. sort of a combination of the two, and they're not coming in and suddenly someone's talking at them in a language they don't understand at all. Okay, what's exactly. going on? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's was kind of the things that I really like when I go back to like that experience that I have as an elementary school teacher. And so then you started doing language work with other linguists and speakers. Yeah. So uh, I started so again uh, when I uh, came to Okma, I, I started working with a group of Kanhobal speakers on the dialectal variation of Kanhobal. Ah, okay. So I was there, I think, less than two years, mm-hmm. and then I left Guatemala. 
because my wife had a scholarship and then we went to the U.S. And that's how I kind of started learning English and then started with the MA and PhD program at the University of Kansas. In linguistics as in well. In linguistics, yeah. yeah. So and I start to work on how children acquire Mayan language. Of course, not all Mayan language, but I yeah, yeah, start yeah. to work on Kanhobal and document how these children acquire Kanhobal. And sort of informed by this experience as a school teacher, you're saying, okay, these kids are coming in already speaking this language. Yeah. What's what? The, what's so going I think on? The, the question like, what what do they know? For example, yeah. so that's kind of the how I got interested in this. Plus, at that time, I had my first son who was, I think one year and a half uh-huh. or something. So, okay, this is an opportunity for me to, <laughs> to learn how to do uh, document uh, child language acquisition, things like that. So then I kind of started to move, I mean, work on uh, and so I, I feel like work. there are a lot of linguists who get interested in child language acquisition because you have a child, right. you're spending all this time and taking yeah. care of your child. What are they doing? <laughs> yeah. I, I, for me, it was really interesting because, again, going back to when we moved from Guatemala to the U.S., the first time I took care of my son. So I made basically like a diary of what he was saying almost every day. So I have like, my notes, I don't know, some, <laughs> somewhere. And then you started looking at other children as well? Uh, yeah. For my MA, for example, I look at, uh, I think, eight or ten children. So mm-hmm. it was a cross-sectional study as for my PhD, I work on a longitudinal study, and my main focus at that time was about how these children acquire the verb morphology in the language. In this case, the word that indicates action, for example, what happens. So, and then the different parts that are necessary in that verb, for example. So we talk about when the action happened and who is participating in the action. So that's kind of the thing that I try to evaluate in my study. And that's something that also that I have been working on in these uh, days, for example. Yeah. So it's, I mean, that's just the kind of thing. It's not like, oh, you study it for uh, one degree and now you know everything. Like this is the kind of thing that people could study for a whole career. Exactly. I think that's, a, that's an interesting point because what I have learned is that, okay, I'm going to so my advisor say, well, you can start with this. And they said, well, okay, I, I started studying acquisition of the verb morphology, I think more than 10 years ago. And I thought, well, I'm done. It's not <laughs> true because every time that I look at the data I say, and I find other things and it's start asking other questions and there's no end of that yeah which is a, you, a nice thing that you start with something small yeah, and you're that's not going to be out of a and, job but yeah, <laughs> yeah. so it, it, it's it's nice I like and then i think one thing that i really appreciate is the opportunity that i have also in documenting the acquisition for my language for example i, saw yeah. I have documented the acquisition of chu and other written my language to Hanhobal, for example. So by looking into a novel language, it helps me to understand what was going on in Hanhobal. And I said, wow, I wish I have access to this language before so I could have a better way of idea of how to explain what was going on. So you can find like some things that are similar between Chuh and Hanhobal and some things that are different because the languages are grammatically, you know, related. They're similar. Yeah, so that really helps in terms of analysis, in terms of understanding what's going on, in terms of like explaining a specific phenomenon, for example, really helps to have that kind of a mirror, for example, right? yeah. seeing what's going on. One thing that I know about when kids are acquiring English is they often make mistakes. You know, so they'll say things like run instead of ran or something like that. And this tells you, oh, they're generalizing something about a rule. Are there some things that come up like mistakes kids that's, make or interesting things that right. kids do when they're acquiring? So that's an interesting question. And that's something that I was looking at, for example, for Chu and for Khan Hobal is that so in Maya language, for example, is that there is this suffix that is known as status suffixes that appears after a verb. So the idea of this status suffix, something like it's indicating what information is provided by the verb. So it's style this, suffix? Status. Status, 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 status suffix. suffix. Yeah, status okay. suffix. Yeah. And it's like it indicates where the verb, it's a transitive verb or an intransitive verb. So in this case, when we talk about intransitive verb, there's one participant of the verb. Transitive verb, two participants. And so if you because, have something like walk, it's going to be intransitive right. and it's going to have one status suffix. If you have something like, uh, well, the classic example is hit, but I always find right. that very yeah, violent, yeah, 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 <laughs> you know, does, yeah, hug yeah. or something. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's going to be a transitive different, and it's going to have a different a suffix. Different, yeah, different. So in, in English, for example, that's just one form of the verb. Right. But in my language, for example, 
you have a specific morphology on the verb to indicate that where you are talking about intransitive verb or a transitive verb. So if it's just I eat, it's going to have one status suffix. If it's yeah. I eat an apple, yeah. it's going to have a different status right. suffix to indicate that yes. that's there. Okay. So I think trying to answer your question is that all of this, I mean, there are all <laughs> things that happen with this status suffix, but I haven't seen children, for example, producing this, I mean, errors with these status suffixes. One thing that we have seen as maybe errors or children like overgeneralizing is the production of these data suffixes in a specific position. So one thing that we know about status suffixes is that sometimes they appear at the end of a verb. Okay. And other times they don't. Okay. But in other times they do. Okay. So then the question, what happens? Like, so in this so case, and adults know this. And adult knows that. But for a child, okay, there are different variations in this status suffix that a child has to kind of find as a challenge, right? Mm-hmm. So one thing that we notice is that these children, for example, produce these suffixes in non-final position. Something that is not seen. So the adults in, only produce it at the end of the at verb, the end, at the end of the sentence? Yes and no. Okay. So if they have like what we call root verb. Okay. Consonant, vowel, consonant is like kind of the idea. Consonant, vowel, consonant is a root verb. Okay. When you have that verb with that shape, let's say, that suffix doesn't appear in the non-final position. Okay. But if you have something that it's, let's say, derived, then that suffix has to be there. Okay. So if you make the verb into something else by changing the tense or something, then... By changing the status of that word. So you have the word song, for example, Mm -hmm. and then you make it as a verb to sing. Then you add a morpheme to it. So this noun song becomes an intransitive. And because of that, then it's a derived intransitive. It's a derived intransitive and you need to have the suffix. And do the kids do this? They produce that. So one thing that we notice is that they make that difference between a derived and a non-derived intransitive verb. Hmm. So again, it's like they are acquiring that, but that's kind of what we see as something problematic for them in acquiring those status suffixes so they have some difficulties still yeah that's kind of the what i would say like where we see them uh, making those mistakes or kind of having trouble of acquiring the suffixes is there something that you've noticed that's interesting about how kids are acquiring the languages you've worked on oh uh, yeah so uh, in addition to the, looking at the uh, verb morphology i have also studied how children acquire the nominal classifier and numeral classifier in kind of, but so in this case some maya languages have nominal classifier or numeral classifier. So yeah. in this language, for example, everything has to be classified. So you refer to a woman, for example, you're going to use the classifier ish, for okay. example, ish. And then mak, for example, for men. Okay. And then I if mean, you have other things like... Um, you know, a hat or something. Yeah, then you will be... Uh, an, for example. Uh, so is that's for, for objects in general, or there's object- several different kinds of objects? Well, for like animals, for people, for objects, and things like that. So, in so if you that, have like a dog or something? That's going to be different. It's going to be not. So I was interacting with this child. He was a boy. Well, first he was interacting with his grandmother. And these classifiers were there. So he was like ish, or nah, or cham, or chan, or no. Everything that was... Everything you expect for all the different kinds of things nice. you can refer to. Yeah. And then someone came to visit grandma. So grandma like left the conversation until bed. So just uh, the boy and myself. Okay. And this is what happened. All of those classifiers were gone. Oh. There's just one that stayed, which is ish. So he's using ish for everything. Ish for everything. But this is not something that he's just making up. It's something that we can see in the other grammar. Oh, okay. So but do other children do this as well? Other children do, but mainly boys, not oh, girls. Interesting. So the thing is that this ish that replaces the all nominal classifiers occur mainly among men. Oh. And people have argued that it's mostly in an uh, informal context. Right. So because his grandma is gone and now you two are men together. Men together like, <laughs> well, he's like three years old. Exactly. But, <laughs> but it's kind of, okay, yeah, let's use the ish, replacing the or. So he's sensitive to like the sociolinguistic context right. of, oh, women aren't here anymore, so I'm going to do this thing. Exactly. Uh, with this guy. With this guy. Right. But Even interesting... at this young age. Exactly. Yeah. So he was about two and a half or three years yeah. old. So this boy is able to distinguish in both contexts. Yeah. His grandma has come back in the conversation. And then those classifiers came back. Wow. So he's really paying attention to this sort of dynamic situation right. of yeah. whether his grandma is here or not, changing how he yeah. talks. So when to use all the classifiers or when to use just one classifier. Yeah. 
for me, it's, again, that's kind of a, a way to illustrate that these children, they're, in, they're exposed to the language and they are exposed to this system of the nominal classifier. But in addition to that, as you mentioned, the, the social aspect of that nominal. Uh, and the cultural context where you, if you just had kids who are trying to learn a language like in a classroom, well, maybe the teacher's a woman and, you know, you don't have yeah. all the different types of social situations. Yeah. So one of the things that it's important to emphasize then when we do language documentation is like, making sure that that interaction with that child mm -hmm. doesn't happen only with grandma, for example, right. but happens with the different <laughs> gender. I mean, in this case, female, male, and also like ages. elders, yeah. ages, and the kids themselves. Because maybe also. the kids are talking differently with each other than they're talking with their right. grandparents or their yeah. aunts and uncles or the older generation. Yes. So the researcher doesn't necessarily know in advance exactly. which things the kids are going to be paying attention yeah. to because maybe the kids don't learn how to talk like the men until they're older. Like you don't yeah. know what age they learn that exactly. until you're studying it. Exactly. I would say the take-home message in this uh, part of the conversation is like documenting everything, basically, yeah. because you never know, I mean, what you will learn. I mean, you never know what will come with this child's interaction. I think sometimes when we're analyzing how kids talk, at least a lot of the studies that I see on sort of big languages like English, they like bring the kid and maybe one parent, you know, the mom or something into a lab right. and they have them talk in this sort of controlled but also very artificial environment. And you don't have the environments of like, well, somebody comes to the door, so grandma has to go answer the door that lets you have this situation where you can illuminate this effect. Sometimes if you do too much control, you don't actually see the natural yeah, I think things that's, that happen. that's the difference that we see, I mean, in this case, between doing an experimental yeah. study and a naturalistic uh, setting, for yeah. example, right? So I think when you do something like in that natural setting, then you have the point to see the language being used in different contexts, for example. Yeah. And I think that's, for example, in this case that we are discussing for the ish, I think it's a unique uh, illustration, uh, like the importance of documenting the language as a whole. Yeah, in the Same. whole community, yeah. cultural yeah. context. Yeah. I mean, of course, then you also have the thing of like, oh, if there's some birds in the background or something, you know. <laughs> well, that's, again, that's yeah. the advantage and disadvantage of yeah. doing this kind of yeah. work. But I think it's good to do both, especially in, when we talk about uh, indigenous languages, for example, right? So you mentioned something important, okay, what we know, for example, about language acquisition, I think most of that information come from the well-known languages. Yep. What happens to these less studied languages or languages that haven't been studying at all, for example, I think that kind of the, how to bring those languages in into kind of discussing what we have learned about language acquisition. Right. And there's sort of two reasons why that's really important. One is because for speakers of those languages, if they want to be trying to support using them in schools mm -hmm. or using them in daily life or trying to revitalize a language that's become less common in daily yes. life, having the knowledge of like, how do kids talk in this language? Mm -hmm. What are their first words like? How do adults normally talk to children in a bit of a different style? Yeah, I think we can say that it's not just about the grammatical aspect of the language that these kids are acquiring, but at the same time, how they are acquiring that language, for example. So I think one thing that it would be good to connect with language revitalization is like, let's learn the language thinking like we are kids. Because a kid, for example, wouldn't think about like, oh, is this the way to say it? Yeah. Should I use this suffix? Should I put this suffix or, on this exactly, verb? Right? You know, like kids don't no, know what a suffix no, is. Exactly. And it takes time for them to get to that production of the adult of the level. Adult yeah. Level, yeah. Right? So for instance, like also the sound system that these children produce. I mean, Kanghobal, for example, it has a retroflex, uh -huh. like sounds like, or, for example, and these kids do not produce them like, <laughs> they can't produce no, them immediately. No no, 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 no. So it takes time for them. So I would say three years and a half or four. Mm -hmm. So it takes that time to produce those retroflex. And I think when we are in like here, the context of revitalization, I think those learns of the language will go to similar like patterns of acquisition, for example. So if you're, you know, trying to relearn Kanhobal as an adult and being stressed that you can't produce the retroflex and say, look, it takes the kids four years. Exactly. If it takes you four years, that's really normal. Yeah. You can keep practicing this and get better at it. And if you can't do it on the first day, then you still have hope, you know? Yeah. That's the importance of doing this kind of project and documenting how children acquire this yeah. kind of languages. And then this information can be useful for all purposes, for example. 
Yeah. Cantabal also has the adjectives, which I'm not doing a very good job of pronouncing, but you've been doing it, <laughs> saying in the name of the language itself, yeah, the Cantabal. Yes. Um, do mm. kids learn those really early or are they a bit harder? Uh, it takes time for them as well. And that's another interesting question because what we have noticed is that these children, when they try to produce these adjectives, mm -hmm. they would follow two strategies. Okay. One, either they produce the plain consonant. So, so say sort of Kanhobal instead of Kanhobal? Exactly. Or they would just produce the lower stop. Oh, okay. So, or something like Amhobal, but I'm, I, I'm just making this up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's one. So it will be something like this. Either they use the plane or this lower stop. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a process. I yeah. Think. Sort of extracting the two right. possible yeah. features so they, that you need to put together eventually. Yeah, this has been reported for the acquisition of sounds in Kiche and Chuch, and I also see it in, in Kanhoma. And these are all Mayan languages that have Mayan languages. So then, like, this, well, yeah. maybe we can, someone will say, "Well, these are uh, dialectal variation, or those just the kids." Uh, I mean, because of individual differences, but no, it's yeah, it's, a, it's across a bunch of them, yeah. and that sort of gets us to the other reason why it's really important to document kids acquiring lots of different languages, indigenous languages, is that when we're trying to think, what do we think about how kids learn language in general? If we base those theories entirely on a few big languages that have other relatively similar typological features, in some cases, you know, English and Spanish are typologically related, and so if you're coming up with a theory just based on English and Spanish, well, you know, that's not very generalizable. Right, that's true. I, I think that's one of the other things that we want to mention here, like how to include all languages to understand uh, human language and also how these children acquire languages, I mean, languages, human languages, languages in the world. And as yeah. I mentioned before, some languages that haven't been explored at all. For example, yeah. so it would be good to document those languages and have a better idea of what these kids do. But the other thing that I want to add here is that, yeah, we want to have a better idea of how these children acquire language, but at the same time, how this information can be used again for language revitalization or for language maintenance or things that the community is interested in. So one thing that I noticed, for example, at this in Kanhobal is that these children, their first word have a basic shape, okay. which is consonant, vowel, consonant. Okay. This is really common in the whole Maya languages, but these are kind of the specific things that these children produce. If that's the case, then is this information possible to use when we consider creating teaching materials for these children? It will be good then to have this because it's going to be much easier if these children can read these words with this shape, for example. Right. So if you know what words they're requiring early, then you can say, oh, well, we'll put those words in maybe the first books that we're trying to have them learn because you don't want to try to have them read a book with words that they don't understand they're not using already. Right. And you can sort of use this small shape because Mayan languages have, you know, quite a bit of uh, prefixes and suffixes and things right. on the, on the yep. words. Yes. But of course, you have to start somewhere. And that's yep. just with the, the roots are generally... Consonant, vowel, consonant. consonant. So they Most just produce the root first, and then and they then, start adding uh, things onto it. Exactly. So they, they are good at identifying those uh, roots in the input or in the other grammar in this case. Mm. Yeah. Also have the opportunity to collaborate with other people about trying to understand how these pieces are put together in a, the verb. So what we have noticed is that there's the root, mm -hmm. and then children are good at producing suffixes. Ah, but not prefixes? Not prefixes, but for a reason. What's that? Stress. Oh. So stress is also with, with, with this suffixes. Okay. So you have the root and then the suffix. And that's the part they do first and then they do the prefixes like much yeah, later. They, yeah, later. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. That's kind of the yeah. other thing that we have. So you work at the University of Toronto now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what sorts of projects are you, are you working on there? Um, well, my position is about language documentation and language revitalization. And one of the projects that I'm currently working on is about the revitalization of Itza, another Mayan language spoken in Guatemala, in the northern part of Guatemala, in Peteng. Mm -hmm. It's a language that is, has been considered like an endangered language because mm -hmm. it has less than 40 speakers. Wow, less than 40. Yeah. Yeah. And most of them are elders. And I think this week I was asked about how old is the youngest. And I say, well, 70 something. Wow. Okay. Right? Yeah. So children are not acquiring that yeah. language anymore. Yeah. So, but the goal in this project is like how to teach the language and how to bring the language back. So that's one of the projects that I am doing. 
how to do that. So one thing that we are doing with the community is like two main things. One is uh, developing a workshop on teaching them how to teach the language. Right, because just because you can speak a language doesn't mean you exactly. know how to teach it. Yeah. So that's one of the things that we did. So like, what would be the best method? So mm-hmm. we're using a method that has been used in our context. And so let's try to use this for the revitalization of ITSA. So in this case, uh-huh. not for all Maya language, but for ITSA because it's of the a, condition of ITSA. Right. Because so Kantabal still has like no, lots still of speakers. Has, yes, lots of speakers. Yeah. 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 So it's different from ITSA. So yeah. that's one thing. The other thing that we are doing, and, and this is, for me, it's really important because we are developing a pedagogical material mm-hmm. that we are using for the same purpose. But the unique thing for this uh, grammar is that we have students at the University of Toronto who are involved in creating information about the grammar. Uh So in this case, these students are like uh, doing research about the structure of ITSA. But there are things, because they are preparing this material for non-linguists, for example, it's an opportunity for them, okay, they have to understand the structure of the language, but then how to share that information with people who are not linguists. Who want to become, you know, speakers. speakers And don't have background in grammar or any exactly. of these sorts of theoretical yeah. concepts, yeah. but they just need to know how to talk to people. Yeah. So for me, like these students, then they have this opportunity to learn the Chippewa language mm-hmm. and then also the opportunity to how to share that information with these people. Right. But in addition to that, having the opportunity to work with indigenous uh, communities and also doing language revitalization, for example. And try to accomplish like the community's goals rather than sort of, okay, I have this research agenda, I'm just going to show up, like extract some information right. and then go off and get a degree and have a career without benefiting the community. Right. So I think that's something that I try to tell the student, okay, it's good that you are learning this, you're doing your research, but at the same time, this is the the, the, the impact yeah. that you are making with your work. Maybe you cannot see it now, Yeah. but later you will realize, oh, this is what so this is what's it's, happening. It takes time to, to understand what you are doing, right? So I think it's, again, I, I consider this as an opportunity for the students to I mean, be involved in this situation. And the other part is like, in addition to uh, the workshop on the teaching method, we are also working with uh, community members about the different lessons that we are putting into this grammar. Oh, okay. So like, how can we do this? Or how do we do this? Or how do we say this? And the basic so if you want to have a, le- a lesson about like foods, you want to make sure you're using the foods that are in the local area exactly. that they want to be able to yeah. talk about, not some yeah. sort of food that right. nobody's actually eating exactly. in this place. Yeah. So, but again, just by doing that, it's a long process. Yeah. It has been a yeah. long process. So we have been working on this grammar, I think, more than a year and we are not even done, but still... That is like helping us to understand how to work with the community at the same time, like how to, I mean, work with the elders who have the knowledge of the language, right. for example. So I was telling, I think, some of the colleagues uh, a while ago saying that, okay, I was asked whether this uh, pedagogical grammar will be going under review. And I said, well, it's going under review at the moment by the elders. <laughs> right. So it's not necessarily going under like peer review by <laughs> academics. Okay. You're having the true expert, which is the elders, look right. at it and say, what do we think? Do we think this is a reasonable reflection of our language? Yeah. How is it like for you as a speaker of a different Mayan language to go into a different community? Do you think this makes it complicated for you or interesting? Uh, it's it's really interesting for me because I always think that I consider this as an opportunity to work with other group of Mayan speakers, yeah. but also an opportunity to help them. Because, I mean, as Mayan speakers or as indigenous speakers, for example, we go through the same situation. And so for me, it's really, really uh, important to consider that. But I also feel like I have built this good relationship with them and to work in this project. Mm. But one thing that I would like to mention is that even though I am a Mayan speaker, for example, even though I am from Guatemala, one thing that I have tried to emphasize is like showing respect for them. Mm -hmm. Again, there are different cultures. Yeah. I mean, we are Mayan, but the way of living is not the same. So I think I try to uh, respect that. Like, yes, I am from there, but that doesn't mean I have to impose things. So it doesn't mean you know everything already. No, no, no. no, I I am, I I, I feel like I always say this and and, and that I am also learning Mm -hmm. with them. So I am helping. We are developing this project, but we are learning together. So that's kind of the approach that I take when working in this kind of project.
projects. Yeah, and you're also coming in with sort of the backing of a big, you know, Canadian research institution and this sort of stuff, which puts you in a bit of a different situation. Yeah, I think it's 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 a lot of responsibility. I think mm-hmm. uh, one thing that I am learning is that yes, it's, yeah, we have to do uh, language revitalization, but I think there's another component that we have to consider. There, so that's about the research aspect of that. Mm-hmm. So one thing that I notice at the what, what I am doing is like working in the infrastructure of the project. Right. Yeah. Building that relationship, working with elders, working with the different activists in the language, for example. And mm-hmm. I think that's kind of the first step. Now we are doing this. But as for research, if you ask me, I don't have much to say. Right. But again, I think building that infrastructure, it takes time. Yeah. But if I like try to think a little bit more, I would say, well, we have some results of this project. I could mention two. One of them is that we have trained some speakers of the language about the teaching method. Mm-hmm. And they are using this method to teach the language. Great. Yeah. And we are about to finish up this pedagogical grammar for the language. Yeah. So I think those can be considered as results. Right. But that's sort of balancing the way that you have to talk to like funding agencies and universities and these sort of bodies that care about results uh, Mm. that you can, you know, report in a list somewhere while also saying, okay, but we actually care about the results that the community members care about, which is having more people able to speak the language, which is not actually what the research institutions are trying to fund. So there's lots of different people who have different priorities that you're trying to balance between. But I think that's that. For me, that's an opportunity of how to communicate those ideas and how to make that balance, Mm -hmm. right? Sure, research will come, research will grow. But the relationship. Yeah, but the question, is it easy to start? It will take a little bit of time. Yeah. So I think one of the things I'd like to mention here, like, a key word I would say is that be patient, mm-hmm. right? Sometimes we, we want to see like really fast. It results but really fast, yeah, yeah. yeah. It takes time. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing that I, I see. In, but I also see that this, I mean, this project will grow and I think there will be more students who will be more interested in working in the project. That's my hope. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> yeah. So if people want to know more mm-hmm. information about Kanhabal or Ichuch or any of the other research that's being done on Mayan languages, is there somewhere where they should start for more information? Yeah, I think if you are interested to know more about, in this case, about the work that I do, I would uh, recommend uh, exploring my uh, personal website. Yeah, so you can go to Linguistics, uh, the University of Toronto, and then you will find my personal website. We'll link to that from the description as well, so people can uh, follow that for more information. Thank you. If you could leave people knowing one thing about linguistics, what would that be? That's a good question. So I would like to say the following. Uh, when you do uh, linguistics, it's good to start with something small. And it's good that you start with that something small. And then if uh, start asking question that maybe you don't have answer to that question, but you will find answer to that question. And I hope I can connect that or relate that to what I mentioned in the discussion that we had today. So remember, I said that I started studying the verb in mm-hmm. Kanhoba mm-hmm. and I am not done yeah. <laughs> exploring at that. So like, start with something small. But the other thing is that, yes, as a linguist, for example, or as a researcher, you have your own agenda. Mm-hmm. But try to reflect a little bit about also the community's agenda mm. and the community's needs. So I think that's important to have that in mind and also important for you to build a relationship with that community that you are working with. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to Lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get redesigned IPA posters, not judging your grammar, just analyzing it, stickers, t-shirts that say etymology is in destiny, and other Lingthusiasm merch at Lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. Lauren tweets and blogs as Superlingo. Our guest, Pedro Mateo Pedro, can be found at pedromateopedro.ca. 
Lingthusiasm is able to keep existing thanks to the support of our patrons. If you want to get an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, our entire archive of bonus episodes to listen to right now, or if you just want to help keep the show running ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Patrons can also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans and be the first to find out about new merch and other announcements. Recent bonus topics include an interview about what it's like to transcribe all of the Lingthusiasm episodes as a linguist, using linguistics in the workplace beyond academia, and a very special Lingthusi ASMR bonus episode where we read the Harvard sentences to you in a calm, soothing voice. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who's curious about language. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our senior producer is Claire Gaughan. Our editorial producer is Sarah Dapirella. Our production assistant is Martha Tsutsui Billins. And our editorial assistant is John Crook. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic. <laughs>